I encourage one another. So we are grateful that you're a part of that um, and just continue to contact, to connect with one another. Um, I think that's all the main stuff going on right now. And so with that, let's just have a word of prayer asking God to bless our service today. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your house today, to be able to come and worship you with one another. Father, we just pray right now that you would allow us to lay your feet those things that might hinder our worship of you. Help us, O oh God, to be able to focus on you in these next you may just help us, oh God, to, to hear your voice for your word and for your prayer. Help us just to relish you together. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Join with me in singing, Come Thou Almighty King. Help us thy name to sing.
reading today, we're doing number 265, week two, shall rise. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. As in Adam, all die, so in Christ. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. But how are they yet with what kind of body will they come? The body that is sown perishable, that is raised imperishable. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Just as we have borne the life of the earth of man, so shall we bear the life of the man from the heaven. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. When he appears, we shall be like him, but we shall see him. May the Lord have blessings to the reading from his word. A great old gospel song is He Abides. Hallelujah, He Abides. Let's sing that one together.
as we go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Just wanted to remind you of a few of the things that we're praying specifically for today. Uh, first, you uh, may not be aware, but Roy is in the hospital. Uh, he's had some issues with his heart and retaining extra water, so he is expected to be there until Wednesday. So we want to lift him up in prayer and just ask for God's healing touch upon him and they, they work with him and uh, getting that extra water off. Also, Jay Hart comes to my mind today. I know that he's been really struggling with his cancer. That's uh, Joyce's uh, brother-in-law, I believe, and so we want to pray for him today. Also, Kim Davis, my friend, started her chemotherapy on Friday, and so just be praying for her as she's dealing with this uh, breast cancer and some awful other forms of cancer there. Uh, and then pray for brother John Hayes, him and his wife Renee, to come and join us once in a while. Uh, as you know, he broke his leg a few weeks back and is still trying to recover from all that, and so he would cover our prayers today. And many others that need our prayers as well today. So let's go before the Lord. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your house, to gather together with brothers and sisters to worship you. And now, O Lord, come before you with our prayer and request. Father, you are the Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And you, O oh God, deserve all of our praise. For nothing happens outside of you. Nothing happens that you don't know about. And we praise you because your love for us never changes. Your love isn't based on what we do or don't do, but your love is based on who you are. Father, how great you are. And how we love your holiness. How we love you. Today we come with Thanksgiving as we think of your prayers answered, as we think of how you've watched over us this week and protected us, even when we didn't know it. But Father, you are always there. You're always right there to communicate with, to hear our burdens and our issues and our problems, to rejoice with us in the walking silence.
Father, may you open doors that we can be a part of the ministry taking place on that campus. That sooner than later, we can be back there volunteering, offering our help and support. Father, we pray for other parts of our community, for our neighborhood, for the park next door, for the people that we talk to, hang out with, communicate with, and our co-workers and friends, and all those we come in contact with right here. Father, we can use our lives to be a light for the world around us. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are within us. May the light of Jesus Christ shine through our lives. And may we be a blessing to those we come in contact with. Father, today we pray for those who serve us, for our firefighters, our EMTs, our police officers, the doctors and nurses. Father, would you bless them today and continue to protect them? Would you keep them safe and give them wisdom in dealing with people? And would you help us as a nation, as a community, come back to the knowledge of Jesus? May we turn our hearts toward you. We are a nation. Repent of its wicked ways and turn its heart toward you. That we might once again become a nation of God. Father God, we just pray for those who are suffering today from this pandemic. That as we even are hearing good news here, we have other places around our, our country and around the world that are struggling. Father, would you provide the healing touch? Would you provide the vaccine and, and the, the stuff needed that people who would be healed, that lives would be saved, and that people would live with you? Father, we also pray for those who are stuck in the midst of the protests and the violence going on. Father, would you provide them peace? Would you help us as, again, a community and a nation to work through these issues and to come out the other side as people who love one another in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? Father, we just pray for all the political chaos going on in the world. Father, may you lead us and guide us and may you place us our, your personal position, the person you would have to lead us for your great work to come. Father, there's much ahead of us as a nation, but we believe in you and believe that you'll guide us appropriately. We thank you, God, for all that you're about to do. In the same, Lord, we want to pray for our servicemen and women, those who serve our nation and put their lives at the line each and every day. Father, would you bless them today and protect them? You bring up beside them brothers and sisters of Jesus who can share the good news before it may be too late. Father, there's so much strife going on around us and around across this whole world. Father, we know that this, this world is in the hands of Satan, that you are in charge. Father, may we see your love and your hope and your peace reign amongst all people. Father, today we just want to pray for those around us, for the prayer requests of those who are worshiping with us here in church, as well as those who are worshiping at their homes. Father, would you bless each one and answer their requests in accordance with yours? And lastly, Father, we want to lay before you our hearts and our needs. Again, Lord, you know exactly what's going on in our lives, and so we trust you. Thank you for all that you're about to do. Even for those things we may not understand, we understand that you're in control and that you have a plan, so we thank you. Father, that is blessed the remainder of the service. May we sense your presence each step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You have turned your Bible to the that is in the Old Testament. You go to the Matthew New Testament, the backwards, the home, and you find the book of Hosea. And I want to read to you today just a couple verses uh, from chapter 4 as we begin. So Hosea chapter 4, and read verses 1 and 2 as part of our scripture reading this morning. Again, Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Hear the word of the Lord to Israelites. 
because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There's only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all vows, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Father God, as we break this word of life today, may you speak to our hearts about all that Hosea was standing up for, and may we learn from it as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, it's probably not too often that you hear a message from the passage of in Hosea. Um, when it comes to the minor prophets, we, we don't really pull them out of our hat very often, but, you know, they do have much to say. And one question that we can kind of start with in our society today, and Hosea was probably starting with back then, is where is God? And maybe we hear statements like the economy of the nation is collapsing. Companies are going out of business. Families that were once thriving are now struggling. Where is God? The morality of society is in decline. People cheat one another. They look, down, they look only out for number one. What's happening in our culture? Why doesn't God do something about this? Where is God? Now again, if you think I'm talking about our society, think again. I'm not talking about the pandemic, the riots, or even political chaos. I'm talking about Hosea and what was going on in his time. Today I want to begin a series of studies on the minor prophets. Now they're not called minor because their message was simply not that important, but because of their size. Each of the last 12 books of the Old Testament is so brief, you can read them in the time it takes for some of us to get our computers on and ready to use. You know what I mean? You know who you are. You turn the computer on. It takes you know five minutes to warm up, and then you got to make it work. Well, some of these books are so short, you could actually read the whole book while you're waiting for your computer to load. You know, several years ago, I was in my personal devotions. I was choosing and typically to read uh, in like James or Second Peter, a book of the New Testament that was small. But each day for thirty days, I was committed to reading the same book of the Bible, and I would do so because each day I could get something new out of it. And believe that God would provide. So I would suggest to you today that you might try that with some of these of the minor prophet books. It has so much richness in it. And I know at times it may be hard to understand exactly what God was saying, but as you read it over and over and over again, I truly believe that God's and he gives us some vital and specific information in these books. Well, as I said today, we're beginning with Hosea of the Minor Prophets. Um, each of the 12 last books of the Old Testament um, is part of that set for the Minor Prophets. Now, Hosea was not the first of these 12 Minor Prophets to appear on the stage of history. In fact, I believe he was actually the fifth. But Hosea comes first in the order of appearance in the table of contents in our Bible. So that's why we're looking at him today. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Hosea, Hosea was considered to be kind of a brilliant theologian. He was a patriot who loved his country. He was a passionate speaker. And when he began his ministry, it was a wonderful time to be alive. It was in many ways like our own society, or at least the way our society was until the pandemic hit and all the rioting began several months ago. My dad reminded me today that uh, March 22nd was the last time we had regular Sunday school. Here we are, almost in October, six months later, and I can't wait for Sunday school to start again, but it's certainly been a different year. The year 2020 is certainly one that we will remember for a long time, uh, and not necessarily in a good way. Hosea's generation was also in good time. In fact, you could say they knew nothing more except the memories of their parents. In ways, it was like our society then. You realize we have a generation of young people who only know of the attack on American soil of 9-11 because of what we tell them? Because they weren't alive or... Old, they just were, or they weren't old enough to remember what happened 19 years ago. And really, if we go back to, to the, the next big attack on America, so we probably go all the way to, back to Pearl Harbor. Anybody remember Pearl Harbor? <laughs> uh, maybe a few that were actually around during that time and were old enough to realize what was going on. We're blessed as a nation. We haven't had a lot of war here on American soil. Certainly, this is a generation. And Vietnam and Iraq and these things going on. We, we hear what's going on, and maybe our families have been affected because of loved ones serving overseas, but we haven't had to deal with it here on American soil. For the most part, 
we've been spared uh, all the atrocities that take place with it. And that's what was going on with Hosea as well. And Hosea had not been in peace for many years, and with it had come economic prosperity. Look at the stock market and the economy about the way it was this time last year. But those wonderful times are about to come to an end in Hosea's day. You see, by the middle of the book of Hosea, the winds of war are beginning to blow. We read in the fifth chapter, sound the trumpet, raise the battle cry. And by the end of Hosea's ministry, the nation of Israel has been defeated. The foreign nation of the Assyrians take control of Hosea's beloved nation, Israel. At the beginning of Hosea's ministry, he sees a spiritual illness that pervades this nation. It looks like things are going well. There's peace, there's good economy, but Hosea looks deeper. He knows other nations are preparing for war. Hosea preaches about the spiritual illness, but the people don't see it. They don't want to see it. Why? Because everything is peaceful. The economy is great. What could possibly be wrong with his nation? Now, when you hear those words, doesn't it kind of sound like America? Or at least before all this stuff started taking place? I mean, after all, things are going so well that why would we not think that we are a nation of God? With the economy up and people doing well financially and, and all these things happening over here, why not think that we're blessed? And yet, as we look at our nation, as we look at how we continue to push God away from not only schools um, and from the government, but now God away from other things, including having crosses in the yard and, and all these things that add up, we can see that America's hurt. We can see that America is going down the wrong path, that America is walking away from its love for God. For Hosea, he could see it in this time. He could see it plainly. And part of the reason Hosea could see it so well was because he was living through it every single day. And I don't mean that he lived through it by being actively involved in a society or because he was just observant of a society. Hosea could see the spiritual illness in his culture because he had to live through the same spiritual illness at home. You see, his marriage was falling apart. The spiritual illness that was permeating Hosea's nation was also the same spiritual illness that was permeating his marriage. Again, he had a lousy marriage. And when he looked at the problem in his marriage, he couldn't help but see the problem of society. Now, let me ask you, this is probably a strange question, but have you ever been to a wedding and looked at the bride and groom and thought, well, eh, that's probably not going to last? Well, that's Hosea and his bride Gomer. She's basically unfaithful from the very beginning. The whole marriage is a sad affair. Jose and Gomer have three children uh, and in quick order, one right after the other, and then shortly after the third baby is born, she's out of it. She's out of the house, she deserts her husband and kids, and engages in an adult affair. Now, his friends, friends probably would have said, Good riddance. Get her out now. Get started, start over. But that's not what Hosea did. The issue was a faithfulness. But Hosea looked at it as opportunity. But that unfaithfulness was the same spiritual illness that infects the relationship between God and humanity. For Gomer, her unfaithfulness is not living up to the marriage covenant. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 5, we find out what motivates her. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. You see, she's more concerned about the things of this world than about being faithful and loving to her husband. In the same way, Israel was more concerned about the things of this world than about being faithful and loving to God. God doesn't really matter to the people of Israel. If we had to ask the question, do we think God really matters to the people of the United States today? I know there's a lot going on with this whole Supreme Court nominee, and I, and I see, you know, they keep doing this poll about when Americans think that, you know, she, uh, the person should be uh, voted on, um, and they're saying like 60% of those, you know, polled think it should wait until after the election. And I think of how divided our country really is. Does do Americans want God's will? Do Americans want God's plan to take place? Do Americans even care about God? Folks, 
folks, my heart breaks because we were once considered a Christian nation, and there's people who still say we're a Christian nation, and yet today, and I'm not going to that full, but in full of all, all kinds of different things, people are not choosing God. People are not saying God should be first. People are looking after their own interests and their own ideas, and what's, what's in it for me? And we've got to come to this place of what some may call lawlessness. And the scriptures talk about lawlessness and the idea that what is right is somehow wrong and what is wrong is somehow right. And we see it across America today in the form of violence and looting and, and the riots going on that, that people have walked away from what makes sense. This week we're dealing uh, as a nation with the outcome of, of proceedings to, from a Brianna uh, Taylor uh, shooting. What a tragic event that was. And yet, we put it before our courts and the grand jury and they, and they look at all this testimony and they come to a decision and because it's not the decision that the people want, they start rioting. Folks, God has given us law so there's not chaos. God has given us ideas and the ways that when we come and, and deal with things we don't like, there's proper ways to do it. If we're not careful as a church, we can become a church of chaos. Or as a, as a city or as a community, we can be full of chaos. It comes down to coming together and following what God has set up for us. God's desire is that we come together in love. God's desire is that we reach out together in love and we, we look for His ways of dealing with things. Do you realize that we serve a God of peace? Do you realize with one simple breath that God could destroy us all? And if you look at history, not just the time of Hosea, not just our time, but throughout history, hasn't there been lots of times where if you were God, history would just be go away? As I was thinking about my sermon yesterday, I was thinking about the idea that you know, there really only has to be, only can be one God. You know why? Because if there are multiple gods, God would have done away with us a long time ago. Right? Because all the other gods have been sitting around the God room saying, hey, you God, you wouldn't be just God. You'd actually have a name like Joe or Steve or, or, or Melissa or something. But if it be, hey, Melissa God, hey, your nation of, of, of Americans over there, they're terrible. Look at how they treat you. Look at how they treat one another. Uh, you should do something about it. That's what it would be if there were multiple gods. But there's not, there's one God. And that God loves us. In fact, He loves each one of us individually. Praise God for that, because we need that. But God loves us all so much that He cares, that He, he waits to destroy us. And yet we hear these words of Isaiah chapter 4. Let me read them to you again right now. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites. Could be you Americans as far as I'm concerned, but this is for, for Hosea. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord is the charge to be against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in this land. There is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Man, that's tough stuff. That's, that is almost like prophecy for today for me, for what we're seeing abound around us. What a charge he makes against the people of this day. When it comes to no faithfulness, the idea of Hosea has in mind is, is rock solid, real, but reliability. In Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4, it says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord, O praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is he. The people of Hosea's day were as far from that model as could be. In chapter 10, Hosea talks about how people make promises they don't keep. They make agreements they don't honor. Lawsuits were springing up like weeds in a plow field. Now, are we talking about Hosea's day or our day? Could be either, right? The idea there's no love. In Psalm 136, there's a refrain. The singers of the temple of Jerusalem would sing this great song. A soloist would sing a praise, and the choir would join in. His love endures forever. I'm sorry, verse 1. I give thanks to the Lord for his good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gifts, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of the Lord, his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Folks, that's the God.
God that we serve, that should be in all of our hearts. His love endures forever. Yet there's no such love in God. Instead, Hosea says, what can I do with you? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that appears. That's from Hosea 6, 4. Folks, God's love endures forever, but our love is like a fog. It's not exactly all there, and what is there soon disappears. Well, then, Hosea also says there's no acknowledgement of God. And I read from Hosea that people take, make a vain and insincere effort toward repentance. It's kind of a cheap grace. They have this attitude they can live however they want to live and ask God for forgiveness. And that somehow he's duty bound to forgive them. That they can go all out and live any way they decide. You know people like that today? Mm -hmm. People who want to live any way they desire and then just say, God just has to forgive me in the end because that's who God is. Hosea looks around and sees none of these things. Instead, he sees cursing and lying and murder, stealing and adultery. Now again, is he talking about his day or our day? The fact is we can't turn on the TV or the computer or our cell phones without being almost assaulted by profanity. There's murder on the news Every day, there's people who steal right and left. You can't leave your car unlocked, even for a moment. You have to alarm your home. You have to protect as best you can. As for adultery, marriages are breaking up all the time because of the prevalence of adultery. Everywhere we turn, people are going against God's path, against God's plan. People say, you know, being a Christian is all about these rules. Well, it's not all about these rules. The Ten Commandments are, are showing us what it means to serve God, what it means to live in hope and joy and peace. When it says things like, Thou shalt honor their mother, mother and their father, Thou shalt not commit adultery, and Thou shalt not envy, and, and, and Thou shalt honor the Lord your God uh, as the only God. Those are all things that bring hope and peace and happiness. It's not, don't do these things because I, I don't want you to, just to show me that, that I'm a good, good God. Don't do these things because they result in heartache. And loneliness and desperation. And yet, Hosea looks at his society and knows that people are wondering, where is God? The economy is collapsing, companies run out of business, families are now struggling, where is God? Can I tell you that God is exactly where he's always been? God hasn't gone away, but the people have left God. The people have turned their back on God, the people have stopped acknowledging God. Don't ask where God is. He has gone away. Look at the people. Hosea sees this in his society and sees it within his own marriage. You see, there's a strong parallel between what's happening in the marriage of Hosea and what happens in his society. Now, again, you would think that when Gomer left Hosea, Hosea would be happy about it. Right? Well, okay, maybe, maybe not at first. Maybe at first he'd be hurt and he'd be sad, but he'd get over it. I mean, after all, she was troubled from the start. Now he can go out and find himself a good woman, a faithful woman, a woman who would be loving mother to the children. But notice that's not what he does. Instead of fleeing from the unfaithful wife, Hosea looks for Gomer, finds her, and proposes marriage all over again. What he did. <laughs> but not really. Right? I mean, that's kind of our attitude. That's our way of life. That's what people would say about us. If you're that dumb, then you deserve it. And yet Hosea was following the plan of God. Hosea was doing what God told him to do. What does he do? He gives her a bridal gift. Paying a very small sum of money and bread. Technically, they're still married. But to pay this bridal gift is to say, we're starting over. Everything is new from this moment on. Now, it's likely that Gomer doesn't love Hosea. But Hosea loves Gomer. Gomer is not faithful to Hosea, but Hosea remains faithful to her. And Hosea is willing to do everything he can to win her back. He never gives up. And Hosea sees that as a reflection of God's relationship with humanity. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give up? Aren't you glad that God doesn't give up on you? You know, I don't know about you, but I'm grateful to be a part of the church in Nazarene. I'm grateful that we're a holiness church. I'm grateful we believe in uh, sanctification and the idea that the, the drive is sin can be taken away from us, that we no longer 
forced to do that, that we can live a kind of perfected lives, not meaning we're perfect, but meaning that we're living as God designed us to be. That's what we believe as a church. We strive for that as, as Christians. And we're not saying we're any better than anybody else. I'm not going there. I'm just saying for me to, 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 to live this life is to say, I want to be the best person I can be in my relationship with God. And yes, unfortunately, I've Yes, there's areas in my life that God is still working on, and I, I assume He's going to continue to work on those until my time here is done. Seems like once I kind of once God and I together conquer an area in my life, and something else comes up, and God says, "Oh, by the way, let's look at this other closet over here. Or let's 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 go downstairs and take another here. Because God is faithful. Because God wants me to be more like Jesus. Because God wants to use me, he continues to work on me. Praise God for that. God doesn't give up on us. And the fact is, whether we got saved when we were little and, and, and had the opportunity to be in church like I did, or whether maybe you came to, to God late in life, whatever the case is, God hasn't given up. And if you have kids or relatives who, who've been with God, they kind of walked away from their salvation, the goodness is God hasn't given up on them. And the truth is, even that person down the street or down the way who has done some really bad things. God has to give it up. And as long as they're still a part of this world, of, of this life, God's desire is for them to come and help them. Praise God. Amen. Whether it was Israelites of Hosea's time or Americans today in our world, God has to give it up. And so we can't give up. We can't say, oh, you know, it's too late, it's, it's too harsh. Instead, we want to say, like, God, here I am. I want to be used. I want, to be, I want you to use me, oh, God, to reach out to others. For that person who would persecute me or make fun of me or even want to hurt me for my faith, Lord, would you bless them and bring them into your kingdom? Would you somehow use my life that, that they might come to know you in a saving way? I think sometimes we may even forget that sometimes people are supposed to die because of the hurt they endure in their life. The truth is, most people have endured hurt so in their life. Something's happened to them. Uh, maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Uh, maybe it's a loss of a relationship. Maybe they've simply been hurt by somebody else, and it's taking them away from God, or or, or helping them to question if God exists. And our place is not to go to them and try to, to make them change. Our place is simply to love them. To live out our relationship with God as best we can. But not to force it upon anybody else. Jose is going to be in a school where cursing and profanity and murder and, and all these things abound because that's what's before them. And that's before us today. Wouldn't it be great? If as Christians today we don't sit up and share the good things that are going on. Now I, I gotta be honest, I'm one of those who's what I would call like fairly new to Facebook. You know, I mean, I'm just old enough that I I'm not really sure how it all works well. Um, but there's these things online on Facebook sometimes that say, hey, let's let's put these nice pictures on and plug Facebook with, with good stories that are going. And I'm always a little nervous that that you know if I somehow copy and paste something that I'll somehow get you know, a virus on my phone or someone will, will you know, do something bad to my phone because of it. Um, but that's not to say that we as Christians can't post something on our own page about what God is doing in our life. I mean, sometimes the church, it's probably been a while, but sometimes we have a testimony hour, right? Or sometimes we have a testimony time where we don't testify. Can't we use our phones or our Facebook pages to testify about what God is doing? I mean, what better way to get the word out? to simply share with people what God has given for us. My prayer is that people will say, well, well, see what God is doing in my life because I'm not perfect and say, hey, I want some of that. I want to know what it is that, that, that helps a guy like Aaron to have peace and joy and hope. I want to know about that. Wouldn't it be great if we as Christians could promote what God is doing in our lives in such a way that people around the world would come to know him? Wouldn't it be great if would come to our church simply because we're telling everybody what God is doing. God 
His faithful to us. Amen? Yes. God doesn't give up to us. Amen? Amen. At the end of Hosea's book, the prophet makes the final appeal to the people. Return to the Lord your God. Let's chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Anytime we feel like asking where is God, we need to remind ourselves that we have been the ones who left God. We have been the ones who walked away. We are the ones who need to return to where God is. Just as Hosea paid a price for his wife, God has paid a price for you. But it isn't what Hosea paid. Hosea paid a handful of change, a little bit of food. God paid the price for his son's suffering and death. And while some in our society look at the pandemic and the riots and the political chaos and ask, where is God? God is in our presence asking, where are my people? He is waiting for us to return to him. And it's time. It's time for us to return to him. Too many people find themselves asking, what has God done for me lately? And we want to live in a society that's all about the moment. What has God done for me now? And they tend to forget about what God has done. You see, way back long before we were born, God had this plan that included you. And you have a purpose. And God wants to use you. And however your circumstances are, good or bad, God wants to use that for his kingdom and his glory. And God has a purpose for you. There's not one person out there today who is made by accident as far as God's concerned. There's not one person out there today that shouldn't have been born, that somehow uh, you know, the, the stars aligned or whatever happened and all of a sudden they're here. Each and every person is here by God's design to be used in God's way. And we need to get that to the people. And it starts by us returning to God. It starts by us celebrating by God is, who God is. It starts by us believing in God. You know, we live in a different world than we did 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, some ways, that's really good. Some ways, not so good. Sometimes when I read about the old tent revivals, that, you know, the, the evangelists would show up in town, maybe on a horse, and they set up a tent, and, and they'd go out and start preaching, and, and they'd preach night after night after night after night after night, and, the, and people, basically people quit coming. And there were nights that they, you know, the, the, the man who might have a cowboy hat, he'd, he'd take the hat and pass it around, and, and no, no money would come in from that, and he'd be like, okay, well, that's okay too. And, and yet if the people were there, and he'd come back the next night too. And as long as the people were eating up what God had to say, he was there. Or possibly she was there. Preaching the word of God. The truth is, in America today, we try to have revival, and we're lucky to get two or three nights out of our home. People have so many things going on today, it's hard to commit to that many nights in a row. I probably shouldn't even share this. I'm sure I've shared it before, but I remember the night when uh, Dan and I were both here. We were like 12 or 13. Um, I'm sure he's already shaking her head. <laughs> and we were sitting, you know, about five rows back, because that's, you know, maybe six rows back. That's as far back as Dan can sit. The teens were right in front of us. We were just barely teens. And, and the revival was like, stop. I think service to, to, to ask the teens to, to knock it off. But Dan and I were too busy playing army men here. And all of a sudden, um, someone, I won't mention her name, a beloved person in the church, came and sat with us. And we knew we'd been met. Always a favorite story of mine. Um, but I remember those days of coming to church for revival night after night, of hearing God's word, of an evangelist pouring their heart out about what God has shared with you. You don't get into this. I think about Acts chapter 2 and how it says that, that the apostles and, and, and the people of God were gathering daily and, and eating bread together and, and worshiping together. And I think, man, what, wouldn't that be a killer time to live in when, when every day the people of God are, are coming together after work or maybe after that, you know, like work in the field or whatever they're doing, but to gather together to worship and to hang out and to, and to fellowship together. I remember, you know, again, growing up in Sunday nights every once in a while, maybe it was all the time, it's, you know, kids and forget things, but, but adults would go after church or families would go out and have ice cream or, you know, dessert on Sunday night. Folks, maybe, I'm just saying maybe it's time to return to be in that kind of a church. To build a relationship where we want to be together. Where we can't wait to hang out together. We're, we're more than just Sunday friends, but we're family. 
yesterday we went for a drive, and, um, and uh, you all know Dan got a new house, and we were just kind of like driving by, and I'm like, let's just stop and say hi. I'm sure she goes to our house, and, um, and, and she did. It was, it was great. Um, and then afterwards, she called us to tell me thanks for stopping by. I was like, well, I really felt bad that we didn't call first. She's like, well, I just family. Just come on by anytime. And I thought, you know what? That's how the whole church is. That's how the people of God should be. Hey, you're just family. Just, just stop on by. Whatever's going on, we want to see you. Folks, God has never moved. God has a change. And as much as we want to stop by and see this person from church, as much as we want to hang out, God is right here saying, hey, come see me. Come be with me. Come be in the relationship with me. God says, I don't care what you've done. We can fix all that. I can help you do that. Come be in the relationship with me. God's desire is for you to know him. Not just your family, not just your community, not just this world. God wants to know you. And you know what? God already knows you. He knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs in your head, the Bible tells us. He knows how many days you have, and yet he still wants to know more. That's the ironic thing. God knows everything about me, and he still wants to know more. Pray for Solomon said, Lucy Solomon said, there's nothing new in the business. What has been before will be again, and so on and so forth. Folks, what we're facing today in our society isn't something brand new. There may be a different path down this, this slope, but it's the same thing that's going on from time to time. Our country, just like the Israelites, is in much need of revival. And the revival happens when Christians get on their knees and pray and seek his face and return to Let's pray and then we'll sing our closing song. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the words of the minor prophet Hosea. Thank you, O Lord, that we can see what happened in his time was happening again. And Father, our hearts are that we want to return to you. We want our nation to return to you. We want to once again become a nation of godly people. Father, we know that you're not a heavy handed God. We know that. You came to us in love, that you reach out to us and, and, and say, come on in and we'll fix you together. Father, help us to be like you. Help us to reach out and love people like you do. Help us, Lord, not to be heavy-handed or addictive or, or, or any of those. Help us simply to love people in your kingdom. Father, thank you for all that you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. Let's stand together, shall we?
of those around us as they come to know Jesus. Father, thank you for all that you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Go